Uh, Thomas Soso, you know, is an artist right now. He has this quite extraordinary installation in Dusseldorf where uh, members of the public can more or less float in a cloud city, is that correct? And Thomas um, has been making works that imagine how we will live in different ways on Spaceship Earth. And with Thomas, we, we did a, uh, a, a very interesting project at dawn by the M25. Right, Thomas, so I say no. Thank you, Rob. Um, and then, uh, what, what, what was it? Yeah, I just before we forgot, Rob, also, I, I'm very sorry that I didn't uh, really um, structure the talk so. Um, to try to be a little bit uh, certain compassion today. But nevertheless, with, with Rob also, we, and, and also like, uh, I'm, uh, as Rob said also, I'm kind of, uh, um, I love the moon, but I never thought so close to the moon. I know that the moon might be a step to go to Mars and beyond. And, um, and also I love the exhibition and the plays, and, and, and I love our catalyst and Rob and Nicola and Gillian, and, and this is great. Yeah, it's great, everything. And the other project that also I thought that it, it will be um, useful, and maybe also I try to speed up the presentation very quickly to then maybe get some questions and some feedback of a project that we are trying to do, which uh, started somehow in a school also, that was at the Hayward Gallery, which maybe now it moved. Uh, Wide open school, yeah. Okay. Wide open school. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were talking about deep space at the wide open school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, you have white sands here, and we're hopefully going there exactly. soon to explore and, yeah. some ideas. Yes. And then, um, yeah, no, it's a wonderful place. I, I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to see uh, what it happened here and looking forward for next project, and we are trying to go there together and see what it happened. And basically we are trying, because maybe what you could help a little bit is, uh, I, I mean, there are two things, it's like, a, um, there are 500 images, this means I have to go very, very quickly. <laughs> and I always thought like one idea is like that each of you will have a remote control, uh, and this means, you know, when you have everybody in synchroni synchron synchronization, press the button, you know, I should stop and talk something about that. <laughs> But I don't know if I will be able yeah. to, to do it. But nevertheless, maybe what we, we try to do is, uh, you know, there are many images which somehow might relate to the moon, but nevertheless maybe relate to the white sign as, as, a, as a stopover to go to Mars. Let's go. And, uh, <laughs> you can go set. Okay. Um, does it mean we are trying to build an, ala an analog uh, as they, uh, everybody has seen this um, uh, analog for Mars 500, right? Yeah, Mars uh, Mars which Mars. was unbelievable. When I saw it in, in the TV, it was in Russia, no? mm -hmm. and then these guys were locked for 500 years. Well, they, 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 they were there for a year, but they were in something a bit like a sauna. And mm -hmm. I think the idea is, is that you want to produce mm -hmm. a environment which would um, create an analog that is kind of a bit more physically challenging than sitting in a sauna for a year? Yes. And, and, uh, and yeah, you see Rob no better than me. But nevertheless, uh, the idea is like to, let's, to build something which could be uh, at the White Sand Desert in New Mexico, um, which we could try to rehearse somehow how it would be a kind of a, um, a flight to somewhere. I always love the idea of the deep space because it kind of uh, got this idea of, um, of this, this thing which when we were talking that, that time is this kind of uh, weight calculation, no? Something like this, that it seems like, uh, you know, any, uh, you know, really go this space, like from another solar system or, or something uh, far beyond the moon, let's say the Mars, uh, you know, that there is this kind of Moore's law of uh, kind of technology um, kind of uh, bottleneck, which it means if we launch today a rocket and then we, I don't know, let's say now, I think so the, the Carl Sagan disc, it reached out of the solar system, no? A couple of years ago, two or three years ago. Correct me, everything which I said because I'm, but nevertheless, uh, um, you know, and then we launch the rocket, we reach this 
distance and then somehow we invent a new technology by the time that we reach this distance we can double the distance this means let's say if i will be in a spaceship today i say okay i will arrive at this point but i will not really take on board on that ship because i know that let's say in 10 years there will be a new technology which it could double the distance where i will be if i will take of today. This means this, this kind of uh, call is uh, the weight uh, calculation, right? Something like that, which is this idea that why we are not taking off from the planet Earth, because you know, we know that uh, the technology we have is all the time doubling the speed on. Nevertheless, we, we, I mean, so far we have been at the moon only. This I means I don't know really where it falls, <laughs> this calculation, but, but nevertheless, um, um, yeah, but maybe because we are waiting, I don't know really. But, there is a, an idea that uh, how to solve this problem because somehow nobody wants to get there because uh, you know you will have somebody who say hey goodbye you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> somehow you want to be fair. but then uh, there is a uh, I think so it's a, in, uh, it started in a Stanislav Lem book uh, where it says well what you should do is like anyway with the all superpower you have to kind of uh, cross your uh, your uh, you should slow down, pick them up, and then again. And then it's kind of this change of slowing down the speed of uh, to reach the other one. And if we agree on this kind of slowing down to pick up the neighbor who had been before, then we might be able to take off, which somehow I kind of like it. Um, anyway, I promise not to talk more than 20 minutes or something. You have 500 slides yes. to go, Thomas. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then I... I I don't know, I just said, like, really, like, if you want me to stop, because in one moment I will go quickly. Does it mean you should really say uh, stop? But I love this man, no? It's like, like <laughs> he's trying to, to look something, but it looked like this man who go in a cannon in a circus, no? Can be launched over there. Does it mean, I always love this idea, I think so we, um, yeah. I mean, again, I think so is a, I, I, but I am trying to look the reference, but I could not find it. But anyway, there are people on the planet Earth we are we are, that we are trying to see if there is life in another planet, right? And then we build a telescope. Uh, I think it's a, again, it's like Stanislaw Lem on Carl Sagan book. And then we build the first year a telescope, or I don't know, 10 inch telescope. Then we look and we say, oh, there is nobody up there. Then next year we come back and we build a bigger telescope, right? And now they are doing this uh, million square, no. It, it, I don't know uh, how many kilometers is in Argentina also, yeah. in Mexico, you know, all this huge. Anyway, the telescope is kind of, every time it's kind of getting bigger and bigger, no? Yeah, ultra anyway. large array, or yeah, the, ultra, uh, yeah. What is the latest, Lucy? Uh, uh, several meters, uh, well, we're building the overworld telescope, which is the kilometer of the radio. Yes, yeah. exactly. Anyway, it seems that there is this idea of, um, as it says the story, every year we kind of uh, build a bigger telescope, and then we go there and we say, oh, there is nothing, and then next year we go to the one, and then and nothing, and then there is a moment that the telescope is so big that the other ones see further the telescope, that we thread through the telescope, see if there is life somewhere else. Which I kind of I like this idea of uh, inverting uh, the same like this, no? it's like you are trying to project something through the ability to try to invent a... Um, something to be able to see, but at the end, the others, they see you. This means this kind of uh, inverse uh, idea. I will not stop on this. Anyway, this has to do with the white sand a little bit, maybe, no? But also, no? Um, on the, um, well, this Julian Knott, no? uh, supported by National Geographic, and then uh, it seems like uh, 2,000 years ago, there was the first civilization who was able to put a man into the air. Uh, to be able to build a drawing on the ground who will not be able to see, you know, about this idea of um, uh, what is the um, uh, technological uh, um, construction that we do to be able then later, you know, to, to, why we do it, you know, and it, it seems really like a, a, um, um, well, National Geographic support this expedition. Basically, is in, in Peru, in the island of Totora, and they build this kind of. Uh, Balloon, and from this height, because there is Julian Maria Reich, this German um, um, scientist that for over 20 years was uh, studying all these Nazca lines, and there is this very straight 
uh, line, which is over, I don't know, kilometers long. And even if this civilization was very advanced on, uh, you know, building all the pyramids in Chichen Itza and Tulum, you see all these, and well, there is somebody from Mexico here, but <laughs> uh, they were very advanced. They could not figure it out how they will be able to build these very straight lines. It's not this the image. And, and the only way to explain this was uh, they found a terracotta in, in a museum in, in Peru where it was draw this uh, tetraedron balloon. Um, and for this high observation point, this mean this was kind of the first uh, man who was put on on air to produce this drone. I mean maybe and there is something in the in, in, I don't know how it will be, but I think there's clay also on the white sand dunes, which is very different the sand that in other environments. And this mean uh, because here is also the, the wind does not blow so quickly. Maybe in Mars, you know, the drawing will be erased very quickly. But um, now I'm remembering the showdown. No, when it's written she by a projection, and I don't know, I'm trying to get some link with moon. Anyway, this I will go through. Ah, and then I, I thought that in relationship with the um, with the um, with the presentation before, which was about the sun and the magnetic field. Uh, we were here um, for over a month. And, um, and, and doing a project which was shown at the Barbican in 2002 or three, making a movie. Um, and one thing which is pretty interesting is the, big, is the second biggest resource of uh, lithium. Uh, and at that time, I didn't have the GPS. This means uh, um, um, there is no orientation. This means, uh, um, oh, oh, well, let me put it that way. First, the horizon can, most of the time is completely blur. Um, during the night, also, it's pretty amazing. But also, there is no north and south. We have a small compass. Uh, it's the biggest, flattest surface on Earth. They were using it to calibrate the telescope, because the difference between one spot and the other one is very, very little. This is why, when it rained, it became this kind of incredible flat mirror, very, very shallow, not so much. This is why they said is, uh, but this means you know we have this compass we were placing. It. They also they use it like a kind of a drug uh, drug uh, road between uh, Chile and to, to, this means there is a place where people cross very very quickly, but there is a, a spot where where it's very easily, but it's very difficult to orientate yourself. This means you have the compass and then you know it's point north here, south here, and then and all the time it change. This means the magnetic field is completely. I think it's like the Bermuda Triangle is something which it does the, the normal compass doesn't work at all. The GPS I think so yes because we get it, but then with the solar wind maybe we got lost again. <laughs> Nevertheless, we yeah. That, that was a, a, a great place. I'm, I'm now I'm trying to go back again to do a, a movie at, at the night. Because, um, yes, yeah, you can imagine the stars, how they get reflected. And when you wake up in the evening and you step like this, all the, the stars kind of wrinkle. It's kind of a uh, yeah, pretty amazing uh, thing. Um, yeah. Well. From there, I don't know if I, I want to get this again, but uh, anyway, maybe this would help us for the white desert sand and, and more kind of earth problem, which may are related to the wind. And, and people were living in a different way somehow, and cities today are so boring, which I think some, uh, maybe cities who might be floating as cloud cities or, or cosmic cities might be different, but anyway, in, in, on Earth, anyway, we have been built in a quite different way and somehow. Today we get uh, we forgot about it. Is that you said that it was quite important that the wind should be doing the right thing when yeah. we try this habitat. Exactly. Sense, yeah. exactly. Exactly. No, and it's amazing. I mean, you look at this village, you know, because it blows with the wind in a certain direction. They build all the villages, which this kind of parabolic uh, kind of dish. Today we could say telecom again, but but it's just to put wind into the house and then keep it cool. Or the other one to build under the ground because also it's too hot. This means I always think, you know, when we put up the imagination and say, oh, why we don't, you know, live here, you know, I mean, there is this thing that sometimes I, and, and, and I love also because it's kind of more my, my own problem, that I study architecture, but at the end, the book which really influenced me more is this, when I started writing, which is architecture without architect. This means there is this kind of common sense somehow that, uh, I don't know how, but it, 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 uh, it get lost, but, uh, but also myself. And the other one, 
is this the cosmic, cosmic view, no, in Fourier terms, which somehow the Eames then later took over, but uh, basically it was done by this school professor of, uh, I think so it was physics, or, or, or I don't remember exactly, but this is the other uh, book which somehow influenced me. Anyway, then we, yeah, I have to go a little bit faster, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, well, Buckminster Fuller is another great uh, person who somehow have uh, made a big uh, influence on, on, uh, on the understanding, no, of this uh, spaceship. Earth. And then a couple of other people also, on which somehow uh, I'm pretty much influenced. Yula Kosice might not have been very well known. Uh, in Ulyanov, I've been also when I met this guy. And this mean, uh, well, I love Cloud Nights so, of Buckminster Fuller, which is something, you know, in a smaller scale might be interesting to bring back at the white sand. You know, this is another concept which today there are some people which are working on that. This is a fantastic, I have a beautiful talk with a man, uh, John Powell, and in San Francisco. I met because uh, our catalyst also helped me to go to study at NASA for three months in something which is called International Space University. And uh, I met this guy over there, then we, we are kind of all the time. But, but, but he, bought, he wrote this book, which is called Airship to Orbit, well, the, uh, well another American space program. Basically, he had this kind of stage of three steps architecture to reach uh, orbit uh, without rockets, only with lighter than air technology, which is the technology which I really love myself. Which this mean, um, um, it, you know, you can divide it uh, heavier than air and lighter than air. Lighter than air is all balloon, airship, beam, zeppelin. Everything that they sus the way of being suspended is a gas, which is lighter. The same Archimedes, but with gases. And the one which interests me more is uh, being suspended by the sun as the big burner. Is, I mean, uh, well, anyway, that, that, that's something which is uh, an ongoing conversation with Andre Kuz. Anyway, I will go quickly. That, let's look at this, what we were doing before. Anyway. Um, well, yeah, different organization of how these future uh, cities might spin around the Earth. I had a, a, a nice conversation when I was at MIT also, and then with uh, this lady, which is she's fantastic. We were doing a simulation on a chamber that usually they put some fluids, how the, the liquids, and then these, it, it reflects on how, how the atmosphere spins and which have a relationship with the water. But I said to her, I posed a very simple question. I said, like, what would be if, let's say, if we have millions of, uh, you know, each of these house, or let's say each of these uh, village, or, or whatever, how they will somehow, um, you know, aggregate, how they will kind of join together, let's say. Um, um, they, they will take the shape like the clouds, no? Uh, let's say, okay, this is Stratonimbus cities, this is a Cumulus cities, you know, it's because the wind is kind of, the, let's say, they are free floating. And then she said, oh, that would be an interesting sample that maybe now we are trying to recreate in this kind of uh, uh, spinning, because they, now they invented kind of a particle which have kind of new, neutral buoyancy. This mean doesn't go down and up. And that so far they have like five or six particles, but. Um, she said it would be interesting to put many, many particles and try to simulate how these uh, cities in the future might be able to, to conglomerate, to, to, to aggregate one to each other. And yeah, well, then some, <laughs> some of the things which uh, I start to speculate, uh, yeah, it's up and down. And this was in London, actually. Uh, this was in Brazil. Uh, uh, this is a hangar Bicocca. Uh, in Italy, this was a kind of a recent show also. Um, um, yeah, I have to take it. But um, I like, um, um, there is something with, with um, you know, um, um, you know um, um, let, uh, let me see if I find the, the drawing. But there is um, some kind of relationship uh, with, uh, with, um, well, one of the biggest challenges who took, uh, to, took us to do this work is to see actually the, the lower part, because there were many, many tiny holes that we could not realize. This I mean, uh, the first thing is like to, for what is a little bit, uh, for me, still surprising is, uh, you know, the unseen part of the work, you know, is that really try to stop uh, air leaking from space. And that actually is the same air that you breathe, is the same air that it keeps these people up there, which somehow it make at the beginning a kind of, a strange relationship of understanding how all this thing it works somehow, and also uh, the other one is uh, is uh, mm, 
let's say, is this, this idea of, um, for example, one thing that it happened is, uh, what, what I call it, a social black hole. <laughs> because somehow, uh, when more people get to a point, <laughs> Let's say space and time, as in the theory of relativity, in Einstein, you know, as big as the mass of the body, it curves space, and then it starts to turn other planets towards you, right? Because that was really what deforms space time. And, um, and this is the thing when many people get together in one spot, somehow all this folly kind of starts to bend and bend, and it's very, very difficult to escape. And, when, <laughs> and this is the thing when you start to do this kind of, uh, you have to very, very slowly start to kind of uh, spin around and then separate one to each other. But, but this kind of, uh, you know, level of communication, let's say I'm always uh, fascinated, let's say, of this kind of uh, extended experience of kind of butterfly effect of uh, synchronicity and also how much it, your body can communicate be, beside the, the non-verbal way of uh, communicating one to each other. This means that it, and, and it doesn't happen only in one level. No, I mean, as you can imagine, health and safety, security, uh, I mean, for me it's kind of a science, science uh, until you don't transit. It's kind of more like a verb, like, uh, I mean, if this lady, no, I don't, I don't re understand really because there are three levels. No, one, two, and three. Does it mean basically the three foils are one to each other? It's like a kind of big lasagna. Does it mean there is no space? I mean, if you put the meat or if you put the person, then it starts to open, right? But that's what is happen, right? It's like you start to walk and then the lasagna start kind of open one to each other. But at the same time, you are pressing a guy which is below to you. Does it mean there is no space between this and that boy, which is down there? Does it mean try to explain this without having been built to the self and safety and say, hey, no, when I stay here, you have to move to the other side and you have to move to the other side. Was pretty uh, complicated, but at the same time, though, kind of confident. Nevertheless, there were some, yeah, here, for example, really bent. And also, I mean, you kind of very quickly learn this kind of. Um, uh, at the end, you know, you start to get used. No, I move, you move. If somebody in the back will start to move, I will be repercuted also by my own and how much I affected, you know, how much I became aware of consciousness in relationship of moving of the other ones, which somehow is something which all the time I would like to to be able to awake my consciousness. No, I forgot what I want to say. But ah, and then people are moving all the time, and then you start to understand. Okay, I, if I get too close, then we bend it too much the space, and I will not move here and there. But at the same time, sometimes somebody in the lower floor uh, is a kind of airlock. No, the two doors are you get open, and this means the air from the ground or from the middle levels that sometimes also we blow some air. It kind of you forgot the door open, and then all the system collapses very quickly. <laughs> Again, this is kind of a, a constant rehearsal, let's say, to climate change, maybe, or something like this, that we might need to learn to get help transit. Anyway, it was uh, crazy, but I have a small talk with Alan Guth, one of my heroes. Anyway, um, there is a moment, ah, let me see here, for example, look at this man, when he wants to go out, he, could, he cannot, right? He need like three or four guys going to the other until he goes up and then he's able to escape. There is, all, I mean, after the, the thing which will happen. And then we are trying to turn this in kind of a floating thing in the Maldives Islands with the hydrogen and, and at the same time make a distillation of the water and so forth and so on. This means... Yeah, maybe I should have drawn the moon here, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I think so, I, I, I got like maybe five minutes left. This means I will go through the rest of the images, some things which I like. Uh, uh, oh, okay, but you stop. Uh, that, that's beautiful also. This is a solar balloon. This is, this is a, a balloon who fly only with the solar energy. I think so, so far, balloons who are able to lift the man into the air, we can even count them with our hands. A very, very little. Very little. I think so far there are six or seven. I repeat again, it's a balloon who is able to lift a person in the air. In this case, he's a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who, it's only the sun who heat up the air, which is inside. This means usually you, you start with a, is a polyethylene, 15 microns, very thin, with a scotch tape, and it's a little bit dangerous, to be honest. I would not recommend to do it anymore. anymore. But uh, there is a new material, which is, that we can do it, and you have to stitch, you have to take a little bit more time. 
but and then you really can regulate the upper part, not like a regular balloon. You open the valve on top and you can go up and down. And usually this, it costs 300 euros. This means it's a, it's a very cheap and way. Uh, uh, but you depend a lot of the sun. This means if there is no sun, you don't go up. Or if a cloud cross the sun, also you go down. <laughs> But when you go down there, it's low, you don't go down suddenly. And uh, the temperature will take a while to, to go down. But it's a tremendous effort to, you know, to convince people that it's a cool sport. You know what I mean? It's like what I'm trying to open now with uh, Cameron balloons. Because there is no category, there is no race, there is no competition. I mean, it's not that I like to compete, but I like to introduce this, this new, you know, spot. Let's say that we could fly with balloons which are powered only by the sun. And uh, people get disappointed because they, you know, you want to switch off the light when you want. It's not that you want to wait for the sun to come out. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit, but I, I will not go on with this project. And... Well, there are some, there, less than one percent of bags are like, This is a, a, a project which is nice, it's called Museo de Solar. It's a kind of, also when I all the time think about, okay, how this cloud series and how, how this thing could be built, no, right? And then uh, this is kind of a nice uh, a community which have formed. Now we, we meet again in uh, the 3rd of uh, February in Frankfurt. Uh, it's happening in, in many different places and it's a little bit kind of a, um, you know, thought on, uh, on, 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 on re-understanding the, the life potential sometimes of uh, plastic bags and, and what we could do and then we speculate on the idea that we might be able to build a museum and then in different places around the world we have been collected and working with a community, and this is Hugo Santa Maria in Medellin, in Colombia and working with some children, this is the Emirates Arabs, these are the canvases that we built this in Einhut in this first. And, and this is where you get in, this is Colombia where it flies. And again, no, this is only the sun. This is mean, it's also it closes in an envelope and then the sun where it, it, where it uh, goes up, uh, the thing goes up. It, this is kind of an experiment because one of the ideas is that we want to launch it, right? And it's able to travel, the balloon, let's say, uh, drawings or, or whatever. But uh, one thing that the Federal Aeronautic Aviation and always asks us is like, if you don't have a, a way to put it down when we be colliding with the aviation, they put it away, of way of travel, you know, because in Brazil they do a lot of, there is a, the biggest community in the world who do the baloeiros, right? But they don't do it with, with uh, reusing plastic weight, they do it with, with uh, paper. But FAA also said, if you don't stop to do this activity, we will stop international flight, because there might be a big accident. But actually, I'm I kind of, uh, politically, is you know, one third, I don't know, the statistic, but uh, one third of all the pollution that is produced through transportation is produced by aviation. It's, I mean, the lighter than air is really like a, I know it's a different speed, I know even with balloons you don't control really the, the way where you go, and so on, and the wind might be a day. But nevertheless, I think this is something that we should uh, um, battle a little bit. And this means here we are trying to build up uh, uh, a small mechanism to bring up and down the balloon and rehearse on, on, on that thing. Well, there are some things you might have seen in, 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 in New York and, and so on, and, and yet how they can... Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm talking uh, with uh, Dennis, Dennis uh, the man who invented this kind of geometry uh, and so on and so forth, which is, which is, is, is a good thing when, when we think about Cloud9, you know? When back Mr. Fuller said, like, look, if we, if we continue with this idea of being powered only by sun, only by the solar energy. Let's say in, my solar, in the solar balloon, the difference between inside and outside is 15 degrees. By this such a big volume, uh, is 24 meter by 14 diameter, 21 high. I forgot now the, the cubic meter. But let's say if you do like a, what Fuller was thinking, is if you do a sphere of one mile in diameter, with one degree of temperature between the inside and the outside, the, the sphere will float just only with one degree. This means, I think so, just by us breathing today here might be one degree warmer than outside and there's no heating inside the pit. This means just by the, 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 the being there five minutes, uh, we might be able to, to be elevated up into the air. And well, I, I, maybe just I skip this, and, and, but, but yeah, I am, there is some relationship between uh, uh, spiders, uh, the origin of the universe, and, <laughs> and, and, and yes.
Well, some of the latest pictures, this is in Dusseldorf, as uh, uh, Rob has said. Um, um, this is a project also I'm looking, maybe have something to do with a deep space exploration, some great collaboration with some other engineers, reconstructing some of the Graham Bell ideas of a tetrahedron balloon, the collecting of the water, going up, some of the things which I would love to, to build up, uh, and what some of the images, how it could be inside, the collecting of the sun, and um, I think so, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. We're going to take some questions, but before that, um, I'd like to uh, welcome those of you who have joined us online. There's a few of us, I think. Here? Here? That way. Wait, which way? That way. Hi. So thanks for joining us online, those of you who couldn't be here tonight. Okay, so I can't see with this thing pointing at me. Let's, um, we're going to take a couple of questions again. You have to be quick, because that'll be it. You know, I know you're... Yeah. <laughs> this is just a very, very practical one, but the um, the place with the small amount of water and everything reflected yeah. perfectly. Where, where was that? Ah, it's in Bolivia, Salar de Ujuni. Oh, okay. Salar de Ujuni. Ah, that's all I want to Salar, say. Salar de Ujuni. Yeah. Oh, that's and, and that but if you go there, uh, um, um, check it out when it's the rainy season, okay. because only like two or three months per year. Okay, close the mic, that way please. Did somebody put their hand up over there? Did you put your hand up? No. Something went like that. Okay. Way, 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 way over the back. There is somebody at the back. Oh, right at the back. Okay. Did you, um, let me ask you a question. So, should I, should I, how, how oh. high have you flown? With, how, how, how high have you flown with one of these solar balloons? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I went up, but uh, I was it was a feather flight. I didn't. Uh, there was a small drop onto the. Oh. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't make a free flight. No, no free flight. But uh, the thing is, like, I put up because there is this small community. One is um, um, well. One of the starters, Dominique Michelis, which actually is a man with, with Gillian. No, we went to visit together, and then he's a pioneer of solar balloon. He's a very old man, he's in a wheelchair, but he's a fantastic man, fascinated about the sun also. And then we recreate and with a, with a dome that I also have put today, but maybe it's like for the images. But um, yeah. But there are these instructions, they kind of do it yourself, this means you can download it and you can... And then I, I made this drawing and then I received an email from a man in Australia. And then he said, oh, look, Thomas, thank you for this. And he's flying very, very long. I said, oh, my God, it's so dangerous. <laughs> so anyway. The basic question is, Thomas, you don't want to die. Well, um, why not? <laughs> you bend away. Question at the back. Um, you mentioned in passing that uh, within a spider's web lies the entire origins of the universe. <laughs> Can you uh, expand that bit? <laughs> no, I, I do not say. Eh? It's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I just read it. But you know, it's like based on this Millennium Simulation at Max Planck Institute, where they do this kind of, it's called the Millennium Simulation. It's the simulation best uh, today, up to date, and they keep it updating all the time. Because when they look at this, they don't know really what it is. The best analogy that they found is like a, try to relate it to a three-dimensional spider web. But what I find out is like nobody have ever looked at it really closely. They do not scan it, they do not have digital. And you know, my analogy is very time, you know, it's like the same like the ocean. Maybe we know more what's going on down there than the ocean today on Earth. And the same, you know, it's funny that the analogy that they try to explain how the universe had or the geometry of the universe is, is to a spider where you look in every corner of your house, maybe you find it, but, and you want to broom it out. But uh, at the same time, you, we don't know really what, how it's there. Uh, but it's kind of funny, this analogy. You don't get lost a little bit today, but, uh, but it's, yes, something that people reduce. Thank but thank you, I think so you will yeah. take me out on the thing. <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks for, for coming to Cosmic, Thomas Saraceno. <laughs>